Hello and welcome to this Ask Me Anything uh, webinar hosted by Deep Science Ventures. Uh, we are talking about the Venture Science Doctorate and um, we're going to answer loads of questions today pitched in by you. Um, but before we go digging into questions, we're going to spend just a little bit of time um, going through the last webinar that we hosted um, in a kind of condensed version because people found that helpful. We talked about uh, the second part of the application process. So round two, where you actually uh, have to do some, some thinking and use our scoping methodology, uh, the method we've developed at Deep Science Ventures to focus on outcomes and to systematically explore the best approaches um, and technologies and companies to build to unlock those outcomes. So we're gonna spend just um, about 15 minutes on this first part, and then please do be sending in your questions into the chat the whole time, and we'll scan through the chat, um, and I'll be answering those for you. Um, we'll focus on the most important question in round two of application process. So um, probably a lot of you tuning in are at round one where you submitted your, your CV and you're waiting for us to assess um, to see if you're progressing round two. Um, and so we'll talk about round two, that most important question. We'll talk about uh, the different strategies that people are using to answer those questions and um, we'll get into Q&A. So Deep Science Ventures is a venture creator um, and to build science companies, we have this very specific scoping ontology that we use. It's a process of working, like I said, backwards from the outcome. Um, so we think first about things that the world really needs, and then we find problems in those uh, spaces, and then we start talking about ideas and solutions that can unlock and, and solve those problems. And so we're, we're always thinking when we're scoping about completeness and possibility. So scoping completeness and perceived possibility. And that leaves us with this hierarchy, this kind of grid of solutions, things that we know are possible. High um, scoping completeness. So there's a lot of evidence ag against that uh, proposition and highly possible. Um, lower scoping completeness, we don't know if these things are possible, but it might be possible. Um, and so this is like one grade of idea. And then when we have even less completeness than that, um, but we're enabling things, uh, this is a tactic. So um, using a mathematical model or machine learning model to capture a lot of data about a complex process, and try to optimize decision-making, that's a tactic. It can be used um, in lots of different instances, but it doesn't tell us um, a lot about exactly what the nature of the solution would be. Then on the possibility, uh, low possibility side, so we have things that we know are impossible, um, at least for the next thousand years, things that are that might be, um, might not be possible. So we don't know for sure that they're a complete blocker, but it's um, worth us as we're working backwards from the outcome, listing these things out. And then requirements. These are certain things that we would we would just want to meet. Um, so they are a kind of blocker. But for example, if you want to generate green energy with um, nuclear fission, uh, this is something that you don't you you require that it it doesn't um, explode and 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 damage the the city or the country that it's in. So, so like just starting principles of things that we need to be true are kind of requirements and, and they also go into the scoping process. So all of this is our language for scoping. And in round two, um, we share this video um, so that you can listen to Irini Maliraki, who's our head of founder community, talk more about um, what each of these terms mean, and how we use them in scoping. And she also shows some examples that will be super useful to people applying for round two. Um, if you wanna watch this video anyways, it's within um, a webinar and I think we might've even broken it out as its own separate video. 
It's called building an outcomes graph and you can use this uh, QR code to check it out. So I'm not gonna spend any more time on the language of scoping. I'm gonna get um, deep into exactly uh, the kind of structures that we can use um, because you can check this out later and uh, the format and some of the pitfalls might be more useful for us today. So if you're getting into round two, um, if you get that invitation from us, then you'll be faced with four questions. Um, one, talking about the outcomes that you want to deliver through your scoping. So what are we aiming at? Two, uh, for one of those outcomes, doing a, a state-of-the-art analysis. And so what are companies doing in the space today? What common technologies and sort of research is in the space today? And how can we describe or kind of get a general picture? Um, each of these will be really concise answers. So we're just asking you to kind of summarize um, your thoughts for each of these answers. And then the third will be listing out hypothesized constraints. So things that it might not be possible to do. Really focus on finding the most important uh, hypothesized constraints because this will influence the, the fourth and final answer, which is about flipping those constraints and about you actually now doing some scoping work of your own um, to say, okay, it might not be possible to X, but how can I question that? How can I tease out solutions that actually might get us there? Um, and so the most important question of these four when we're scoring these is question four. And so I just wanna walk us through a little bit some of the different logical structures that people are using. Um, and that will be useful to everybody who, who's coming into round two. So for this uh, round of the application process, we are measuring scope and quality through these indicators. We want outcomes to be ambitious, well-specified and quantified, uh, clear logical chains, original thinking, multiple approaches. And so all of this will be like in the portal for those going into round two, but it's helpful for us to remember this at the outset when we start talking about structures of logic. Um, and the kind of mistakes that we see a lot of are where um, hypothesized solutions, which are a kind of outcome, um, are not well technologically specified. So we might say we want to do X or um, like a really like a really good example of this, but but a bad a bad um, uh, example to to use yourself would be um, just suggesting that we invest more in biological research. There's like no um, technological specification on that at all. It's not therefore a good um, outcome to, to detail out in your scoping. Obviously it's, it's true that if you invest in research, uh, things could be learned that could unlock progress, but we're trying to be very clear and um, focused on the technologies that can be built and the technologies that can be leveraged. And then another common pitfall is not actually building out a logical chain. So I wanted to show what logical chains kind of look like and what we mean. And also um, it's very difficult to kind of show original thinking and be very creative. So again, that video by Irini will talk you through some of the creative moves that people are using. Um, but if you're really pushing yourself to explore, you know, how do we generate um, clean energy at grid scale, or how do we uh, come up with curative approaches to cancer, you drilling into this systematically, you should sort of come across things that feel a little counterintuitive to you, and, um, and ideally things that have maybe never even been suggested before. So a logical chain, let's spend a little bit of time on that. This is um, this is a kind of structure 
where we start with a hypothesized constraint. So you would have had four hypothesized constraints from question three if you're if you're using the kind of case study structure that that we would send out. And so a hypothesized constraint, a statement of what's might not be possible, then a first principles question, teasing out where there might be space to do something um, to flip that constraint, and then a hypothesized solution. Um, this is a really good way to repeatedly deepen the, the approach that you're designing as you're using scoping. So you can continue to kind of build out a full chain repeating this process. Um, what's key is that really the best scoping has pushback against the hypothesized solutions. So you, you would say it, it might be possible to X. The problem with that would be this, the way that we could come around that might, is, is it possible to come around that through, through the first principles question that you raise? And then you can repeat out again and you get um, increasing definition and clarity on what your hypothesized solution is. So an example of, of this that we have um, in the applications portal, which I'm just gonna chat people through is this climate one where it might not be possible to reduce energy requirements um, for CO2 capture. And so that's the initial hypothesized constraint. And then this example moves through a question. Okay, what are the energy intensive parts um, of the process and processes that we rely on? And then by answering that, it already lands on two potential ways forward. So thermal swing and ventilation are high energy processes. Um, and so we can then get very clear. We can, we can see the connection between the solution that's being proposed, the age sol, and the problem through this kind of questioning. Um, and then we can keep questioning those and keep sort of developing out. And so how might we alter post-combustion capture to reduce dependency on thermal swing? It might be possible to do that um, by avoiding thermal swing ap approaches altogether. So using pressure swing approaches, um, it might be possible to alter post-combustion capture to reduce the dependency on ventilation as well. So like really logically allowing us to sort of follow your train of thought here and tease out where there is possibility to get around the constraint of energy requirement. Um, and then there's more technologies detailed here of how we could use membrane separation, the problem with using membrane separation, teasing that out with more questioning, and then there are another sort of three different types of membrane that are opposed here, uh, proposed um, from sort of graphene to um, MOF membranes, metal organic frameworks. And so this is the kind of thing that you want to be doing in your own answer, where you're sort of systematically moving. Here's, here's a statement of what might not be possible, questioning it, then a statement um, sort of answering the question, which might already be your hypothesized solution. What's wrong with that? Making decisions between these different solutions um, is something that we need to see. So you're choosing between HSOL as you're moving through, and then you're deepening um, and moving towards a clearer and clearer understanding of, of a technology um, or a set of technologies that would be a real hypothesized solution, something that might be an answer um, and that might lead to company creation. We don't need explication all the way down to something that you would put, you know, and sort of try and patent. We don't need the idea and we're not trying to source ideas from people, but it's this chain of, of thought. It's this logical chain and all of these reasoning steps and decisions that you're making that we're really scoring, which is why, um, there are two other formats that I want to talk through where we get 
a lot of answers in these formats that don't have any of that structure um, and therefore can't score highly. So one I just sort of referred to as chat GPT, um, where it feels like the kind of answer you would get from GPT. And this structure is one where we just say, hypothesized constraint is this, um, hypothesized solution is that, next constraint, solution is that, next constraint, solution is that. And there's no first principles questioning. So we can't see connections between why you chose, why did you make that decision? We can't see any of your working out. Um, and so it's hard to score well with that kind of answer. And so here's an example that literally I, I picked this constraint out from someone's scoping from round two and threw it into GPT and got these different answers back. And so what GPT sends you back is something like this, um, which I just want to explain why this is not helpful. And this is basically the format that a lot of people write their answers to whether or not they, they use GPT. Um, and so what you have here starting each of these suggested solutions is some kind of truism, like something that, yes, if you invest in research, we're going to make progress, but you can't, you can't get any points in this process for saying things like invest in research or the fifth one there, explore novel engineering strategies. Like that's just a statement um, of, it, it doesn't tell us any of your thinking. Of course it's true, but there's nothing um, noteworthy in it uh, when we're trying to answer these questions. And then there's a lot of sort of justification of the original statement. So if you did this, um, this would lead to that. Uh, and sort of sort of repeatedly making an argument for the original um, kind of simplistic statement. Um, and also something that's not helpful in all of these sort of yellow sections is where we're just describing um, processes. So, you know, this works this way and you're using that as a kind of implicit argument to say why we should um, explore techniques to nanostructure or modify you know, a, a catalyst. So this question was about um, using catalysts at a certain pressure and temperature to try and improve the process. And there are all these um, strategies on what we can do with catalysts, but just describing um, how catalysis works in the Haber-Bosch process uh, although it's it's relevant, it's not what we're looking for in these answers. We're looking for hypothesized solutions and the technologies that can be leveraged um, to unlock the, the constraint. Um, there is some information that you can get from GPT, which is useful. And all of this is a sort of useful introductory step, but we've not yet seen decisions being made or any logical connecting um, between any of these statements. So that, that's the kind of failure of this kind of approach. And another kind of failure mode is what we call pitch, where you literally propose one hypothesized solution um, for the hypothesized constraint, and then just keep saying, you know, different kind of variations on a theme of why that is a good hypothesized solution. So, um, one of the hypothesized constraints to the use of, let's say, quantum dots um, for topsoil regeneration is the high cost of production and application. So in this case, the, the outcome is to regenerate topsoil. It's an agriculture case where um, you know, topsoil is sort of degenerated as we, we grow um, plants and, and fruits and vegetables in it. If we could regenerate topsoil, uh, we could unlock a lot of arable land and that would scale agriculture. This would be really valuable. Um, there are different technologies that we could use, but in this answer, we zoom straight into quantum dots with no kind of rationale or explication, just that this person probably has a background in doing some research with that technology. And then the rest of this case is just we should use quantum knots because um, it would lower costs. It would uh, allow other 
um, clay minerals and, and soils um, to be modified through chemical and physical treatments. It's like that kind of information, just stating um, generically, uh, we should do this one thing and it would have all these benefits is sort of you trying to persuade us, um, but not logically moving through with first principles questions or explaining what would be wrong with a specific use of quantum dots. And then using, you know, it might not be possible to produce enough quantum dots um, at scale for like uh, maize production in a certain geography. Therefore, um, what could we do to unlock scale for this technology? And so like we explicitly need to see first principles questions and this kind of pushback on your own ideas. And this format of just pitching one, one approach is, is not super useful. So just flicking through this, um, these are some of the limitations in this answer. Um, we're, we're maybe not looking at the most critical constraints in the first place, so we started wrong. Um, the first principles question is a rephrase of the hypothesized constraint. So the quality of first principles question isn't high enough. And, and you can see like th this is not how we would build out a logical chain. So just flicking through this, um, these are the kind of two sets of common pitfalls. And what we're really interested in is uh, that logical chain structure. You can see in both of these, we don't have first principles questions and we don't have pushback against the hypothesized solutions. So I just wanted to run through that because I know a bunch of you um, have submitted really great applications and we'll probably be going through round two um, when we open that that next cycle um, and wanted to show you some of the things that we've seen people um, get wrong very often. The key there is actually tracing the logic and exploring different technologies um, and showing us how you're you're landing on the suggestions that you make. I'll stop there and stop sharing screen and um we will start taking questions because this is what you all um, also came to do and we've already got 50 questions so let me just read through some of these okay so uh one question that's voted up is on timelines for the application process and when you get feedback um and so everyone who's currently applied has been broken into different um cycles and absolutely everyone will have feedback by the end of April. Um, there have been more applications than we anticipated and this has slowed us down a little bit. Um, so it's great to see the enthusiasm for the program, um, but we are a little bit uh, delayed uh, in terms of where we want it to be in getting feedback to everybody. Um, having your results back? Yes, this is a similar question. Um, have any results been given? Yes, in some instances, uh, we, we have been moving through different cycles of people applying. So in December, um, there was a round of people, there's been another round in February, um, and we're gonna do another uh, soon. Some of the results from December have already gone back to people. Um, so we are moving through this pipeline of about a thousand applications at the moment. Bassam asked an interesting question about success metrics. And so there are different phases of the program, but I guess the things that are really important are the scoping that you'll do in the first year. So um, I hope you all like know, but the Venture Science Doctorate is three years. It's a PhD program for building a science company. In the first year, you are enrolled in these 10 courses that we've designed, where we've really looked at the founders in our community. So Deep Science Ventures has already built 40 science companies. Um, and we've looked at those founders, pharmaceuticals founders, climate, agriculture, computation, and thought, what are the, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that have made them really excel? and built our curriculum around that kind of um, meta archetype. 
of an ideal science founder. So your metrics are going to be different in years one, two, and three. The real outcome and aim of year one is to engage um, in each of the courses. So there's different criteria for success in each course. Um, but a really key thing is to have leveraged your, your own process of scoping to have a long list of approaches um, for whatever challenge that you're trying to unlock. So if you come in focused on pharmaceuticals and you want to um, come up with curative approaches to cystic fibrosis, then you would have used scoping like you're going to use in the in round two of the process um, to build out and understand the space both commercially and from a like academic research point of view you'll begin building that kind of decision tree which, which will become much more um, complex than what we're showing you what i've just shown you in terms of the examples and you will become a kind of expert really in what technologies can be built to unlock curative approaches to cystic fibrosis. Um, and so you should have that set by the end of year one, and you should have already uh, started working on what from first principles you can prove is the, the best of those uh, approaches. And then in years two and three, there are milestones around your prototyping. So you have those years to work in really some of the most entrepreneurial labs in the world, um, from King's College London to uh, University of Edinburgh, um, Cornell University, the Helmholtz Association, uh, CGIAR, which is the world's largest agriculture research network, um, all of those labs uh, are open to you to go into, to prototype in, to actually move between labs so that you can do proper interdisciplinary research. And if your technology moves from, you know, you sort of prove out and complete some kind of synthetic biology component, you can move to another maybe uh, microfluidics or engineering component and have a, a full device at the end. So there are different ways that we can measure the progress of your prototyping. And then at the end, you'll have a founding team um, and the investment criteria that's applied to the companies that we form will also be applied to the work that you've done. And so we can measure success in terms of whether your idea um, meets investment criteria and is backable by deep science ventures. Um, Boyle asks about the PhD title. What kind of PhD title are we getting at the end of VSD based on focus area opportunity chosen? So um, you will get a fully accredited science research PhD. Um, this will be uh, in the space that you are working on. So climate, pharmaceuticals, uh, you will be sort of specified as a climate venture scientist or a biotechnology venture scientist. Um, and that is accreditation that under the European Commission and the Bologna process is recognized by countries all over the world. Um, so you will have that PhD. The main aim really of this program is to build your science company. So um, the PhD will also function as something that signals to labs that you wanna work with and collaborators that your work is rigorous it's something that will give you shots on goal for other careers if for any reason you you don't form the company or if you move out of the company that you do form. We want um, your work to be recognized uh, for the rigor that you put into the prototyping phase and the scoping phase where you're really, you're not just focused on what papers are telling you, but you're actively going out and speaking to deep tech founders in the space. Uh, the investment community who know a lot about technologies in your space because they, they see a lot of um, different companies. Um, in some cases, policymakers who are also uh, pouring over different aspects of what we need to do to remove commercial barriers out of the way of innovators. 
Um, and in some cases, that's funding programs. In some cases, that's um, sort of regulatory sandboxes so that you can actually test different types of technology. So for example, there are some states where you wouldn't be able to test a drone uh, because you're not allowed to fly things a certain height. So all of those conversations across what we call the innovation ecosystem with stakeholders in academia, in industry, the investment community, policy making, um, and, and all stakeholders who are sort of around the technology and the company that you're building, we would encourage those conversations. Loads more questions. So keep voting them up and that will help me find the ones you guys care the most about. Is it possible, so Mark asks, is it possible to do lots of lab work in year one in order to build skills and knowledge in a domain faster? E.g. synthetic biology, enzyme engineering, material science. Yes, it's possible. It's built into the curriculum. So um, if you check out the program guide on the website, you'll actually see what each of the courses in the curriculum are stepping you through. And one of those is focused on actually doing experiments um, over a few months. So even before you go into years two and three, you are in a lab, you're actually um, testing out different hypotheses that you would have developed from your scoping. Um, so you'll definitely get to do that and we encourage you to do that. We would also just sort of make the point that your scoping will probably resolve a lot of things that you could also try to test through an experiment. So you, you wanna design experiments where you're really learning faster by doing the experiment. Um, so in some cases, like a, a day in the library can spend a month in the lab, um, save that time. Uh, and, and so in scoping, especially if you're going and speaking to people who have made those mistakes before commercially or, or through their own research, you can absolutely be saving time by scoping. Um, but you will, this is a fair point. There, there are plenty of cases where you want to test things by building, by doing the actual experiment. And we have a course in experimental design where you will think about the critical path of experiments that you need to move from zero to prototype most efficiently. Um, so this is a great question and thanks, Mark. Okay, Tali uh, asked an interesting question about prototyping beyond year three. If you need more time for prototyping beyond the three-year PhD, what is the support DSV provides, if any? So this is this is great. So um, what you should be able to do by designing the experiments that you're going to do in years two and three, by choosing the best collaborators from the network of like over 30 universities and national labs and corporates that we're working with, is move faster than you normally would in like a, a PhD research project. Um, we were also encouraging people to use modeling, to use robotic labs um, in our network. Just every, every advantage that we're already throwing um, to kind of prototype and come up with something from those two years that um, proves out the narrative that you're pitching to investors. Two, two things to like add around that. One is that in a lot of instances, a company at Deep Science Ventures doesn't need uh, to execute its own lab work to get investment. Um, you can already learn so much from the experiments that have already been done and published. In some instances, things that were published 40 years ago and just everybody forgot about. But if you're specifically trying to unlock a question um, for global challenges to be solved, um, that piece of knowledge becomes relevant. Um, so you can, you can get investment with maybe less uh, lab time than you would expect, given that this is a PhD program. Um, 
And by the end of that three years, with your very well, like rationalized hypothesis of what your venture should be, and then some prototyping and, and sort of first data behind proving out what you're pitching, um, you're in a good position to get our investment and in many instances, co-investment. And that means that you essentially have started a lab. Um, it's a it's a science venture. So your your research is very applied and focused on a specific challenge in the world, but you're funded to keep doing that research. And so beyond the three years, you should be in a good position to have funding to continue uh, doing the research that you are um, passionate about and that's actually creating impact um, against a, like an important problem. In addition to that, we spend a lot of time training on venture finance and um, narrative design and, and how to build an effective pitch. And, and so um, you shouldn't need as much lab work as you think um, to get VC investment. You should, by the end of the three years, have a prototype on top of the kind of minimum that you need to get investment. And uh, you should be very well skilled up by the end um, in fundraising and going out and getting more investment, which is something that all of our companies do and, and do quite successfully. So all of that is a kind of um, answer to how, how you can continue um, and the role that prototyping plays. But we really wanna get you to the point where you can launch that science company and continue doing your own research and continue bringing funding in around it as opposed to fund the entire um, 10, 15 year development of a, of a product pipeline. Ankar asks a question that's got a few upvotes. Um, and give me a second to find it again. Um, I think it was about being a virtual program and what support there is for um, the community to come together. And so this is a program that is fully funded and we cover travel. And what we do a couple of times a year is bring everyone together um, for a week-long intensive where um, you're spending all that time like recreationally, um, but also in training and also in events that we organize with the community. Um, and so this is the venture science doctorate cohorts, but also um, DSV's broader community of the people that's working at, at DSV and the portfolio um, companies. And our last intensive was in London. We took people to the Francis Crick Institute um, we did some sessions where we were looking at people scoping. Uh, there were lots of like um, games and tours and things that we did just for, for fun together. And um, we hosted a round table at number 10 Downing Street, where um, I think that was a great opportunity uh, for, for our candidates to kind of meet people who, who work more closely with the prime minister of the UK and some of the um, people who came to the round table who represent uh, really useful stakeholders to get to know from industry and from the investment community. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing um, to build out that community. And then obviously in years two and three, you're also embedded in physical labs. Um, so you can go and meet your lab and you have that uh, community as well. Um, we have a question from Ji Yang about uh, current support from her her professor already. Um, so I have a professor who uh, is supporting me at the University of Edinburgh doing AI for chemistry and was wondering whether there's any space for collaboration here. Where would I mostly be based for this doctoral program? So the first year of... of 
the VSD is virtual and, and decentralized. So you could be based at the University of Edinburgh. Um, there, there is space to collaborate. So we're already working with uh, a lot of labs at the University of Edinburgh on the agricultural side and on um, labs focused on medicine and, and a few others. Um, so maybe write to me and we can see where we where we go from there. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite straightforward for us. And there are a lot of labs who are excited and interested in um, forming this kind of partnership. Um, I'm just seeing some questions that I think I've answered already. So keep scanning. You guys keep voting up ones that you think I haven't. There's a question about um, whether the virtual nature of the program means that you you still have to be based at one of our partnered institutions. You don't. Uh, you can be based wherever you are in the world, quite quite literally. Um, and the training is delivered through our virtual format, which um, people have been giving us really great like feedback on. We have this um, this kind of uh, avatar space where you go in and um, you have your your sessions and your courses in year one with the rest of the class and with the kind of guest lecturers that we bring in with some of the DSV team. Um, and you learn through like games and projects that you do. So it's it's actually super immersive. Um, and people really uh, have clicked with it and haven't minded so much. That on top of the fact that we're bringing people together to meet each other and to meet um, the wider DSV community seems to be working pretty well. Let me keep scanning here. Pejman asked a question about cooperation with other institutes and whether they are partners in the venture that's formed. Um, and so that really depends on like the form of partnership that we have with them. Uh, it's not strictly the case that um, anywhere you go and spend your time as a researcher, uh, that that institute is automatically a partner um, or has, let's say, equity or, or um, anything like that. So we've really focused on keeping the equity for the founders in this program. Um, and that's important for the various rounds of funding that you'll have to continue to raise after um, the initial investment. Uh, what a lot of institutes um, are eligible for is, is co-investing in the venture that's formed. And so in that way, um, they can they can be partners participating in, in sort of the value of the company. Um, but if you guys have people that you want us to collaborate with or that you're already working with, probably the best thing to do is to just um, write us in and, and let's um, have that conversation with them. Um, there's a question from Anirud about what kinds of projects qualify for deep fundamental research with regards to CS technology, um, which I'm not really sure. Maybe Anirud, you could like expand on that. Do you mean what kinds of questions, uh, what kinds of projects? you would take forward in the VSD or what we think qualifies as research. Do you have a higher chance of uh, being accepted in the program if you're already collaborating with a partner institution? Not really. Um, it's really based on the work that you submit as you're applying. So most of the people who are, who are on the program didn't bring a partner. Ebony asks about what to do next after having submitted her application. We are going to get back to people um, on whether or not they've been accepted into the round two uh, cycle of applications. And then from there, you will submit a case study like what I was talking about at the top. And then from there, there's an interview. So um, there are these different three different rounds. So hang tight and we will get back and uh, let people know whether or not they're progressed to the next phase. 
How many people are currently in the program? Four. When does the next cohort begin? Uh, in September. Does DSV own part of the company after the three years? Yes, DSV will own 10%. Um, and that leaves like considerable space on your uh, cap table for other investors. So, um, and, you know, we're an equity investor, so. Um, so there's an anonymous question about the Global South. If I'm in, oh, and, and things just jump when uh, the next question comes in. Uh, but I think I remember it. It was basically, if um, if you're interested in focusing on the Global South, what kind of support is there for you? And how extensive is the network? And so um, I guess our we, we have a number of uh, partners with facilities in the Global South. So CGIR is focused on agriculture research. I think they're in, in operative in a hundred countries right now. Um, and Anglo-American also have facilities in the Global South. Um, so, so we should be able to get the to a lot of different places. Um, obviously, this is a kind of matching game between whatever your scoping is and what lab space you need. Um, and in terms of the support, I think the main thing is that you would conduct this kind of scoping focused on an outcome, you would work backwards and sort of systematically build out what are the different approaches that can be used to unlock that impact. Um, like we were talking about the top solar generation one, that would be huge for the global south um, and for agriculture. And then the support you have is um, three years of funding. It's the access to labs all over the world. So you don't necessarily have to be uh, in the Global South to do research on top solar regeneration or on something that's relevant. Um, but we do have several research facilities there, the ones that I mentioned. Um, and we would uh, we would give all of the support that, that you're already getting um, in terms of funding, in terms of collaborations, uh, our network of investors and um, other companies that are operating with a view to like impact the global south. So um, that's our kind of package of support. Um, sp specifically around the global south, I think it's just the research networks that we already have in place there. And then there are like partnerships through some of our institutional partners. So um, King's College London also does a lot of work partnered with um, different institutes in the global south. Um, I hope that answers some of your question. Okay, there's an upvoted question here on um, maybe nobody submit a, a question just for a second while I read this because it's a longer one. I have a couple of questions about the degree of freedom and autonomy that we have in choosing the topic on which to focus on how binding is the topic we choose to do the round two scoping? And how much does the topic trajectory evolve during the VST journey? Also, the degree of freedom, what about choosing with whom and where to establish collaborations during the second year and third year? How does it work? Uh, thanks, Marco. Great um, set of questions. So uh, you really have a lot of autonomy. What, what we're doing with this kind of scoping ontology is giving you the ability to justify to us what um, spaces you should be working on. Um, we would hope that a lot of people apply with their own idea, and we would hope that you would use the three years of research and the collaborations to come up with the best possible idea in a space that you care about. Um, and if that means that you find something that's better than what you initially apply to, we would encourage uh, that, but um, that's not really a a loss, um, and, and we would hope you would see the uh, increased impact as, as value from the program. Um, so the topic 
from round two and that scoping that you do is not binding at all. Round two is a way for us to um, give everybody the kind of same set of problems so that we can compare um, in a fair way how people are solving those problems. And we really wanna see your decision-making process. Like how do you move from constraints through questions to solutions and repeat this out? Why do you choose certain solutions over others? Um, what do you identify as super important constraints or are you distracted by constraints that are really just focused on the a technology space that you already care about? So you, you have a lot of freedom I would just encourage people to be idea agnostic and to go for impact um, to generate the the most meaningful outcome that they can from the program, because we've uh, built out this platform, funding people to to use all of these research collaborations and the time uh, to build literally the most impactful, most valuable thing that you can. Um, so use the freedom to to do. Uh, your your utmost in terms of the collaborations that you can um again this would be personalized around what you're working on so you're doing the scoping you're kind of driving and um coming to us with a clear narrative of why you should be focusing on a certain area um and then that's very easy for us to communicate through deep science ventures through other research collaborators you know this this is the rationale and we have utmost confidence with you and then we can really be um supportive in bringing all the collaborators um different universities uh corporates like anglo like GlaxoSmithKline, but also like there are a host of other people in our network um so the collaborations are built out around what your your kind of driving at as you do your scoping. I hope that's clear. We're not trying to shoehorn you into a specific program because at the end of the day, the company that you build is something that you need to stick with um, to keep fundraising and to bring more people in and to grow the company. Um, and, and this is what like a lot of founders who have been really successful at DSV uh, have applied to do and have cared about the most. So we're just focused on that model of delivering impact um, and letting everything configure around the narrative of, of highest impact. And that's how we get most quickly to series A and the other things that we want to achieve after the venture science doctorate. We are almost up to time. So be upvoting anything that I haven't covered. For people who submitted in February, you will hear back from us by the end of April. The interview, so we give some more information for those who get into interview, um, but it's really, some of it is focused on the case study that you submit and some of it is focused on you as a founder um, and the qualities that you would bring to a company and um, some of the things that are important for uh, the resilience and and different aspects of actually building a science company um, so that we just have both of those things assessed. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Um, if the DSV methodology has an outcome that's intractable or impossible, what will happen? Must I come up with a new idea? Will DSV assist in tweaking the original idea? So uh, people come across things that are impo impossible all the time through scoping. This is why we kind of focus on this decision tree approach where you explore multiple routes and we don't expect them all to work. In some instances, more than one route is worth investing in and then you can kind of build multiple companies. But if it's something impossible, you would have also built out your plan B and plan C and other great um, avenues to achieve the same impact. Um, if the company fails, or I guess if you if you don't build one, we can still award you the PhD. And um, there are a number of companies, both that we've built and that are in our space, that you could be hired into. You would have honed skills that are really super valuable um, to to a lot of spinouts that. Uh, we work with and have built. 
I mean, those are two options. There, there are another set, but I won't go through everything just now. You will need a visa for the different kind of traveling um, that we're doing as we bring people together. And guys, we are at time. I don't see any other massively upvoted questions. So um, thank you so much for joining the session. I hope we've um, given most people um, really good answers. And uh, if there's anything outstanding, do write to us. We'll, we'll wrap up there. Thank you.